Right, good morning. How are you doing, Chris? I'm fine, thank you, in sunny Thailand with no COVID. Good. <laughs> Lovely <laughs> to talk with you. And this morning, I'm interviewing Chris on gut, how to get a healthy gut, how to keep and stay with a healthy gut, and how to repair a gut. So, Chris, we've got a load of questions here, so I'm going to fire straight away. First question is from Jackie in Toronto. Um, I've always eaten well, never smoked, exercised a lot. I'm 53 and I now have IBS. How did that happen? Um, right. It's very easy. What puts down your good guys? What puts down your good guys? It's very easy to believe it's just drugs and antibiotics. So, yes, drugs and antibiotics are the, are the major criminals. And the worst drug is actually a proton pump inhibitor called omeprazole, but they all damage the gut really badly. Um, secondly, you, so you could have damaged your good guys that way. Secondly, uh, you can actually eat badly. So your good bacteria adore soluble fiber. They love oats and there's something called psyllium, P-S-Y-L-L-I-U-M. They love vegetables, they love nuts and seeds. They love um, pulses, legumes. And so you can feed them up that way. Alternatively, you could have fed their friend, their enemies rather. Their enemies love um, high fructose corn syrup, sugar, alcohol, lactose in dairy and eating fruit after meals because the sugar sits on the top. Um, third thing could have happened to you somewhere. You probably don't even remember it. You could have got um, food poisoning. You popped out somewhere, ate and you had diarrhea the next morning. You never thought anything of it. Now we know that when you get food poisoning, it can be a parasite, it can be a bad bacterium, but it knocks out good guys. So good guys go down that way. And the fourth thing you can get, as you, change, as you said, you don't smoke, but you can change your own, your own gut pH. So when you were born, you had a very acid gut. People talk about having a, an alkaline body. No, you need alkaline mitochondria power stations, but you need acid gut. And the real issue for all us oldies is to try and keep it acid. How could you change the acidity of your gut? Stress, smoking, binge drinking. So there's a, a number of reasons you could have put your good guys down. And when you put your good guys down, yeast, which is IBS, yeast come into your body on every mouthful of food. And when you eat the food or a glass of beer or a red wine, um, they take over the gut and they can kill you. But it's all right, because at night time, you've got all these good guys and they're going to eat the yeast. And um, unfortunately, if you put the good guys down because you were stressed or something, then they're not there. So the yeast take over. They make you slightly bloated and they put little holes down across the gut wall. And then you go and eat some gluten and make the holes bigger. But either way, with little holes, you might get small food molecules through poisoning the bloodstream, still leaky gut. And if you eat gluten, you'll get big holes. And now the yeast will get into your, your bloodstream, leaky gut. Wow. <laughs> well, okay. Right. Robin from Cork in Ireland. I have breast cancer. I'm 38. I had antibiotics as an acne treatment for two years when I was 18. Did that have anything to do with it? Yes. <laughs> totally. <laughs> That's the answer. I don't, you know, it's sad. I get so many women with breast cancer who've actually had um, antibiotics for a couple of years between the ages of about 15 and about 20. And of course they put their microbiomes down. Nobody ever thinks about the microbiomes. Do they make them stronger? They then go through the 20s to the 30s when they don't eat very well, bingo. They've damaged their microbiome enormously. So yes, wow. um, yes. I mean, we know, for example, one of the, one of the most fragile of of bacterial families is the lactobacillus family. And what happens with women, they get mastitis and they literally don't have any lactobacillus in them. If doctors give out antibiotics, but actually one of the quickest fixes is to take a probiotic with lactobacillus in it. Um, equally, we know that women with breast cancer usually have no lactobacillus in their bodies. It's a, it's a family of about 250 strains Amazing, amazing. Jeff from Los Angeles. I have colorectal cancer and I'm 31. When I was in China 12 years ago, I developed food poisoning. My gut's never been right since. Are they connected? Yes. <laughs> there we go. OK. Um, <laughs> do you want a longer answer? Um, exactly the same. Look, everybody who gets cancer 
has lost the volume of good guys, lost strains of good guys, and as a result, three things happen. The immune system comes down because the immune system is produced in response to all these different bugs. It sees them as invaders. The second thing is when the immune system comes down, the good guys come down, bad guys come out to play. And the third thing is when the good guys come down, you lose the production of molecules. So you lose B vitamins, vitamin K, serotonin, melatonin, and some things called short chain fatty acids and so on, I'll come to those. But what happens is the bad guys come out to play. And in colorectal cancer, if you had food poisoning in China, you would have had most likely a parasite. It could have just been a bad bacterium, but I would say it was probably a parasite. If you have a parasite, it trumps everything in the gut. It changes the whole microbiome. That's a really big thing. And we know, for example, that people with colorectal cancer have lost a good guy. It's a member of the Clostridium family, and it does something really clever. It binds to um, fiber and kicks sugar out of your body before it does any damage. And or if you've got too much sugar in your gut. And we also know that people with colorectal cancer have gained fusobacterium. And they've also gained larger quality, quantities of E. coli. So we, we, they've got two bad guys in them, and that's, they're the driving force. Fusobacterium in every case of colorectal cancer, according to um, the people in, in, uh, in uh, New Zealand, um, microbiome otago, I think it is. Um, and E. coli is the lieutenant in two of the three types of colorectal cancer, end. Amazing, just amazing. Claudia Brachita, I would like to know what to do about how to help my adult son with his acid reflux issues. About three weeks ago, he had what is perhaps now the third or fourth attack in his life. The pain is so excruciating that his brother had to call the out of hours emergency services. He gets milder versions more frequently. Please help me educate me so that I can help him address this. Okay. Ordinary acid reflux for a lot of people is just a question of bringing acid up and they're lying in bed and things like that. So you can prop yourself up and so on. Okay. But actually, more serious cases of acid reflux are to do with Helicobacter pylori. There are other bugs involved, but Helicobacter pylori is the principal one. And Helicobacter pylori inhabits the stomach. And when you eat acid, acid requiring foods like proteins, you make more acid in the stomach and Helicobacter pylori rushes for the mucous membrane in the stomach and hides. And so taking things like bog standard um, antacids is actually the wrong thing to do because it comes back out to play again. It kind of you've got rid of the acid for it. Um, vets know more about this than, than any doctor, I, as far as I can make out, because racehorses get Helicobacter pylori. And um, what does the trick is golden seal and bismuth. So bismuth you can get in gastro bismol, and I would put him on a course of this. I would give him a golden seal pill every night and one in the morning and make him take a swig, that's a biochemical term, of um, gastrobismol at night time before he goes to sleep. However, I will say that I had Helicobacter pylori, which I, you've got, everybody's got it in them, but you kind of release it if you get food poisoning and things like this. And I got it from Morocco. And you said to me years, this was years ago, it came back out in me. 14 years after I got it, when I was putting my companies on the stock market. And you said to me, I reckon you got a parasite. And I took parafree and parafree got rid of it. So gastrobismol and, um, and, uh, bit, and um, golden seal or parafree, they both should do the trick. But he's got a definite infection. Excellent, that's sad at that age as well. Yes. Okay, Catherine Terry. I have Barrett's esophagus and a hiatus hernia take lansoprazole, which I know is not good for my gut microbiome. What can I do to maintain my gut micro microbiome? Well, I think the first thing to say is you should be sitting up a little bit in bed and you should do what I've just been saying, really, and make sure that it's nothing to do with helicobacter pylori and so on. I understand you've got a, a damaged valve, um, but I think, that, you know, you said, what can I do? Answer, come off the, the blooming pre P PPI because, the PPIs are dreadful. So 
the answer is, can you manage it? Can you manage your acid reflux by propping yourself up more in bed, not eating after six? You know, make sure your six o'clock meal is carbohydrate, because if you eat meat and fish, you make more acid. Um, I would I would sort of go the simple route and I would try and come off it. and I would kill Heathrow back to pylori if that's a player. Um, and I would just try and keep my acids down, take some, take a little bit of um, an antacid every now and again, something like gastrobismol. Not, not, not every night though, I'm, I would manage it. Don't eat coffee, don't drink coffee, don't have alcohol after six o'clock at night, things like that. Okay, um, Nevada Christian, I'd like to ask about butyrate. I was taking and have stopped. Is this supplement good for a leaky gut? Yes, um, a lot of yeses today. Yeah, um, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we, could have been, we could have done in about one minute so far. Um, all right, you have a gut wall. You have a gut wall. And when you get a leaky gut, those nasty yeasts I told you about actually pun punch holes right through what I'm gonna call the sandwich. So if you're really fit and healthy, you have a gut wall, you have a gut lining, and you also have a sort of mucus cover, okay? And the bugs punch a hole right through the three. Butyrate does a whole host of jobs. One of the things it does do, it's made by about, well, 30 to 50, or is it 150 bugs? We don't know yet. And butyrate is a short chain fatty acid. There are three short chain fatty acids. Acetate, which keeps you nice and acid in the gut. Propionate, which actually blocks cholesterol forming in your body. How clever is that? And butyrate. And butyrate heals this gut wall and controls inflammation in the gut and in the body. It's like the big controller. And it even attacks colorectal cancer cells and attacks cancer cells in the body. It does a few other things which we'll come to. So answer, yes, butyrate is really good for healing the gut wall. Excellent. Okay, because I take butyrate on your advice. Um, Sils, Susie says, my husband has pancreatic cancer. I heard you on a health show saying it was linked to problems in the mouth. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, there are about three or four different studies on how gum disease is, people with gum disease are linked to pancreatic cancer. And I started telling people this about six years ago. And funny enough, one of my first patients after discovering all this, was sent to the dentist by her uh, oncologist. Um, what happens is basically all bad guys come in through the mouth. Think about it, even COVID, I mean, comes in down the tube. Um, and um, we know that you've got bad guys from that for that reason, but also pancreatic cancer involves a rush of bacteria, gut bacteria, good and bad, to surround the pancreas. The, literally the number of bugs in the, in the pancreatic microbiome goes up a thousand fold before you get pancreatic cancer. No one knows why, but it does. But there's also something else. There is, um, I, I, I can't, can never remember his name. It's called malazaria. There's a yeast. There's a yeast involved, malazaria and this is very present in pancreatic cancer. And this probably comes through the mouth too. But what happens is they took a load of healthy pancreatic cells, dropped malazaria in, nothing happened. But then they found on the outside of the yeast, there were carbohydrate molecules. They're um, called MBL. I don't know what it stands for, I can't remember. And, <laughs> and um, they dropped the MBL molecules into the pancreatic healthy cells and bing, pancreatic cancer, oncogenesis. So it's, um, it's called mannose binding, binding lectin, lectin, I think. Um, so that's what's happened. It's all come through the mouth and you're absolutely right. Get your gums and teeth and everything else sorted before it's too late. Anybody what, listening or watching this show. Sylvia says, by the way, if you're gonna start saying absolutely instead of yes, this show's gonna take longer. Yes. <laughs> uh, Sylvia, Sylvia says, I have bile, bile duct cancer. I saw that you wrote it was linked to a parasite. If I kill the parasite now, I have the disease. Is it all too late? Uh, There's two questions there. 
Um, is it all too late? No, go tell Jeffrey Boycott it's all too late because that's exactly what we did. Um, and I'm going to hazard a guess to say that I don't think it's too late in 70% of cases. I think if you look at the bad guys, the pathogens, I call them infection in the gut, they make toxins, but they also make microRNA, which changes your microRNA for the worst. And with Jeff, you know, he did said on the show he was given 12 weeks to live, yeah. which is just crazy. But in the midst of everything, I gave him a parasite killer. And, and when he went into Leeds, wherever it's called, Royal Infirmary, eight weeks later, they were bloody embarrassed because it, it took his parasite away and that took away the microRNA. Um, what was the first part of the question? Oh, yes, bile duct cancer. Now, bile duct cancer, we've got patient Derek and Derek um, was given six months to live. If he took the drugs for four months, he had an operation. But bile duct cancer is linked to liver fluke. And we know that. I mean, you come out this part of the world and you get liver fluke. And liver fluke is quite common. Also, I mean, India, I almost have, <laughs> won't do any more people in India in terms of patients. They've all got a parasite. And um, bile duct cancer is very, very common. And so it's common in liver cancers. It's uh, uh, liver, liver fluke is common in liver cancer. It's common in bile duct cancer. And you also get a lot of yeast wrapped around the, the bile duct. So they, when yeast get into the body and go around the body, they colonize areas of the body and they are anaerobes. They reduce the oxygen in that area. They don't cause cancer. They just create favorable conditions for cancer. So then the liver fluke comes along and creates all the toxins and cancer. Lou Goodhead asks, as a cancer patient taking off-label drugs, particularly doxycycline, is it possible to create a healthy gut biome alongside antibiotic use? No. What more? Um, <laughs> <laughs> There is research on doxycycline um, from a group of people with early breast cancer patients, and they showed it reduced the markers for cancer stem cells. There is other research with um, cancer stem cells where they use doxycycline level one, normal level, and then gave a month off and they lose it level two, 50% more, and they use it at level three, 100% more. And it left after killing lots of cancer cells, it left just normal cancer cells, which could be dealt with berberine or intravenous vitamin C. So this is why care oncology are using doxycycline. However, and I have a little argument with Jay McLennan on this one. Um, you know, Hippocrates said, all in all starts in the gut. The Human Microbiome Project 2008 to 2011 said very clearly, your gut gets ill first, then you get ill, and you can't get better until it gets better. And I genuinely believe that. I think with all my patients, when I do a PP, I am trying to rebuild them. And I have considered, and I'll be honest with you, we've got something like a hundred, we've booked all next month. We've got about 150 people waiting for booking and we've considered not helping the care oncology people till they finish their treatment because it's doxycycline's doing the opposite to what I do. And it does absolutely screw up your gut. I'll give you a little, for instance, in America, they did a study on stem cell transplants and they gave people two drugs, that was all, four rounds of two drugs, antibiotics over the stem cell transplants. And one year later, left to their own devices, people only had 27% of their microbiome left. Two drugs, four times, and some antibiotics. So imagine what doxycycline is doing to your gut every other month. I, I, personally, I wouldn't go near it. I haven't touched an antibiotic since I was 32. Can't do anything. Right. Very hard. Okay. Um, you, what should he switch to? What should? What should Lou switch to? What should he be taking? Right, well, um, there are other things. Ben Williams, Professor Ben Williams used Accutane, but that's got side effects on the liver. Um, there is something called an eclosamide where you need a, a low P53 gene and that can knock tumors back. But actually the answer is very, very simple. The answer is um, there are 
a dozen natural compounds that work really, really well. Cancer stem cells, the biggest areas in pancreatic cancer, and then second equal is brain tumors and prostate cancer. What works really well with prostate cancer? Stem cells, um, ursolic acid, U-R-S-O-L-I-C. It's in holy basil and pistachio nuts. Um, lycopene, turmeric, resveratrol, EGCG, ashwagandha, and then um, fever few. Those, I mean, there's a list on our site, but- What is e sorry, Chris, what's EGCG? EGCG is in green tea. Oh, okay, great. And all Thank those you. things do a double job in prostate cancer because they don't just kill cancer stem cells, they actually deal with glutaminase, an enzyme which con converts protein, glutamine, glutamine's amino acid into glutamate, which feeds prostate cancer. So they do a double job plus the, the job they were originally intended for, lycopene cutting your blood fats and things like that. Really important bunch of natural compounds. Wow, wow. Mike Hall uh, says, recent scientific research from Edinburgh University appears to indicate that incurable motor neuron disease suggests that dysfunctional mitochondria appears to switch off the brain's neurons and prevent them from firing. Do you think that in time, a cure might be discovered by scientists understanding the biological electrical relationship between the brain's mitochondria and the gut microbe axis link. I think it might even be simpler than that. There's been new research out showing that with brain tumors, for example, the astrocytes in the nerves, the astrocytes um, get inflamed and they get inflamed because gut bacteria have been lost and those gut bacteria normally make anti-inflammatory molecules. And these molecules travel to the brain, cross the blood brain barrier and calm the astrocytes down. So it's very early days and half the problem as he would know is that all the research is being done up there for the brain and <laughs> it should be being done down there. Dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, the whole lot, it's all being done up there and it should be done down there. Yeah, I know. Ross Solomon, he says, in your newsletter, you talk about Acomantia mucinfila for controlling gut health. You also state that we're not born with this bacterium. It's manufactured with the help of breast milk. So why is there not more of a push to get people using mother's milk in this treatment of gut-related issues? And of course, for older folk like myself, as you've said, Acomantia mucinfila decreases with age and to improve your health. Acomantia is another one of the super um, bugs. And what it does is it sits on the inside of the lining, basically. And it eats the mucus. And because it eats the mucus, all its other little friends or enemies, perhaps, actually make lots more mucus. So you end up with this lovely mucus lining, which is what you should have. And when you were born, you didn't have a lining to your gut. And mum's milk colostrum, early days, but mum's milk came with a gut lining production kit. And that gave you the lining. And then Acomantia came along. I think it was probably a little bit of it in mum's milk anyway. And in a healthy gut, it's about 4%. And I got sent two studies from people with cancer recently from Atlas. And um, their Acomantia was less than 0.2. So in cancer patients, as you would expect, they've lost the lining, they've lost the mucous membrane, because they've had all those drugs and antibiotics in their treatment. And the second part of the question was, why isn't everybody encouraged to do this? Because you tell me all the doctors in Britain, all the oncologists in Britain who know about the gut. And we'll start counting them. I've got one hand ready. <laughs> Quicker to say yes. <laughs> Safer to say yes, I think. <laughs> Rosemary Howard, really simple, direct question. How do you rebuild the gut after chemotherapy and antibiotics? 
all right, I'm going to do this once. <laughs> when we when we did it on the on the show with Julian, we did it about nine times, but we probably didn't do it totally. Okay, I've told you, you can have infection, you can have bad guys, you can have parasites, you can have bad bacteria like Fusobacterium E. coli, you can have viruses, e. Co um, herpes, shingles, cold sores, you can have HPV, you can have um, Epstein Barr and things like that. You can have viruses. Just so you know, there's 90 trillion bacteria in the microbiome. There's 150 trillion viruses in your virome. Most of them inhabit the, the bacteria. They're called bacteriophages and try and muck it all up. Now, the fourth thing was yeast, which I've done. So four sorts of infection. Then I've told you all these things that put it down. Okay. So that's what's happened to someone who's just had chemo and, um, and antibiotics. So you're, you're at your lowest point when you've come out of three rounds of FEC, some radiotherapy, some surgery and whatever. You're at your lowest point. Doctor goes, see you in three months, see you in six months for your scan. But you're actually now about to go under or rebuild yourself. So this is what you've got to do. We use a simple program. I'm going to give you the model. But we don't use it for everybody. It depends what the, I think the person's got, depending on their answers. But we would use oregano oil or oregano oil for our people across the water. Um, oregano oil for 12, 12 weeks. It kills yeast. It does a few other things. We would put alongside it for 12 weeks, Powdarco. Powdarco kills viruses certainly attacks them, makes them weak, but I think kills too. I used to think that Powdarco cured cancer when I came into all this about 20 years ago. Well, it knocks out yeast and it knocks out viruses. So we're doing a double whammy on the yeast and we're killing the viruses. Then we get to week 12 and we tend to switch. We switch to artemisinin and we use artemisinin 300 milligrams at night time, 10 days off, 10 days on, on six times. Why? Because I never know whether the person sitting in front of me has a damaged or fatty liver. Never know till someone gives me some results. And it's safer because you can get jaundice. Very, very occasionally you can get jaundice from artemisinin. We then also give people in parallel to that para free. So the artemisinin is there to kill E. coli and bad bacteria. And it also happens to kill yeast, but it also um, kills about a third of all parasites. So that's the little background there. So we're, we're doing 20 weeks of yeast kill anyway. And then para free is to knock out any parasites, the ultimate insurance policy, but also para free has got an antiviral in it. So we've got 20, 20 weeks of viral killer. So we've dealt with all the bad bacteria, all the yeast, all the viruses and the parasites, bingo, 20 weeks. But we do something else at week 12. At week 12, we give people, just before, we give them butyrate. Some point between week one and week 12, depending on who they are and what condition I think they're in. And as I said, butyrate heals the gut wall. And then at week 12, having given them apple cider vinegar and, and a bit of sauerkraut and kombucha and things like this, as I told you, yeast feed um, on lactose, apart from sugar and other things like so yeast feel on lactose. So I'm not giving anybody any milk for the first 12 weeks. But on at week 12, I do the poor man's version of what Julian Kenyon does. I give people a tablespoon of raw cheese. And I give people a couple of tablespoons of chuckling goat kefir. I'm not advertising. Chuckling goat make this really strong kefir and they sell it to you online. But they tell you to drink 400 milligrams, mils, but it's got lots of sugar in it, so I don't want that. I want you having just a, just a tablespoon of cheese and a couple of tablespoons of, of uh, kefir. Now, the cheese is giving you trillions of bifidobacteria. The kefir is giving you trillions of lactobacillus. So I've taken you back to where you were when you were six weeks old. Why? Because that's really good. It keeps all the bad guys away. You were really acid, bad guys like alkali. So, so you're keeping all the bad guys away. The butyrate helps the bugs colonize. This was exactly what Julian was doing. I've been doing it for about eight years. 
So that's what we're doing. Now, as I said, the cheese also comes with a lining production kit from mum. So now you've got butyrate that's healed the, the wall and you've got the lining forming. And in between this sandwich, and you've got Akamansia doing its job on the outside, but in between this sandwich, butyrate, for example, activates vitamin D, right? An active vitamin D goes to your T cells and can attack COVID or cancer or whatever. And also what happens in, in here is that butyrate is very anti-inflammatory, butyrate starts getting stronger, or the bugs start getting stronger that make butyrate, attacking colorectal cancer cells, attacking other cancer cells around the body. So I'm controlling inflammation and I'm attacking cancer cells. But this lining is where all your bugs sit. So that when you get another cancer cell or when you get COVID, this lining responds. And also in this lining, mum's milk gave you immunoglobulin A. I think someone asked about how do I put my immunoglobulin A up? Answer, or N and C. You've got M and C in the body. Take mother's milk, take cheese, raw cheese. Because now you've got this lining operating. It's spotting all the bad guys. It's sending messages out around the body. And immunoglobulin is sending messages around the body. 70% of your immune system comes from there. In. Fantastic answer, fantastic answer. Robin Kimmeling asks, he says, my gut is probably leaky, having painful symptoms and hard protruding midriff, only partially relieved by milk vessel, gas gone and many deflated. Does that indicate either stomach ulcers or cancerous duodenum? Sometimes, some days, I'm back to normal. Could there exist a link with foods consumed are there any recommendations? All right, you'd have to go and see a doctor. I, I, I can't tell on the Zoom call 6,000 miles away. I would say you're doing it wrong. I was, I mean, milk thistle protects your liver. Um, Gaviscon, you know, mass market antacid, really. I, Robin, I think you should play this Zoom back a few times. I think you're one of our members anyway. And I think you should play the Zoom tape back. And I think you should do exactly what I've just told you to rebuild your gut. You've clearly got bad yeast but when people start getting pains it's like that acid reflux one earlier on when people start getting pain they've got an infection in there and you see the other thing too you get diverticulitis and colitis we had some questions on that and i've, I've answered it all because I, you know I, I go on american sites and i won't name names but you get people saying diverticulitis you need a probiotic no you don't that's like a total overclaim for what a probiotic will do you need to fix your wall. You need to fix your lining. You need to get a mucous membrane in. You need to kill the bad guys. You need to put good guys in. That's what you've got to do to fix your gut. It's like five steps. It's not a couple of probiotic pills. Mm. Anna Lawrence asks, um, you said previously, Chris, it takes six to eight years to make your body conducive to cancer. When a baby or a child has cancer, does that mean it's linked to the mother's gut health and passed on to the child? Uh, can be. Okay, not a yes, not a no. Um, it can be genetic. Let's be quite clear about this. I mean, it can be genetic. I just did the Children with Cancer Conference uh, a couple of years ago. I spoke at it, and it was all about brain tumors, leukemia, and all that sort of thing. Um, so there can be a genetic twist to it. But we do know definitely that, you know, if a woman was 110% healthy, babe travels down a pristinely clean fallopian tube into a pristinely clean womb and then picks up all these wonderful lactic acid bacteria, bifidobacteria, lactobacillus strains as, as babe comes through um, the birth canal. And then mum whacks her onto the breast and Babe is picking up more bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. So babe is now perfectly acid in the gut and keeps all the bad guys away, as I said. So that's in the ideal sense. But, you know, I mean, I don't know what the figure is, but how many babies don't come through the birth canal born to cesarean births? How many babies don't get put on, on the breast for very long? And we, we also know in Africa, there are some illnesses that get passed on from mum to baby. Actually, the, the good work on 
healthy babies is done in Africa too. So some people in Africa who live very natural lives have very healthy microbiomes and, my, um, and down there as well. So babe comes out wonderfully healthy as you expect in Africa, but others are um, really bad. And in America, you see this, this is where you've got a problem with say autism. Now I know I'm gonna get rude letters for this, but in, in America, you can, a child can get autism through a combination of events. No one thing gives a child autism. So yes, if mum is incredibly stressed, that will change her vulval um, uh, microbiome. And then baby might not be fed very long. Baby actually can have problems, um, not a very well developed microbiome. As you know, my grandson was given antibiotics literally overnight on the first day of his life, which is crazy. And yeah, and in the end, you get to the MMR jab. So it's not a simple, Mr. Wakefield is saying it's just about an MMR jab, but you, you've got this buildup of problems and then babe can't cope, young child can't cope with the MMR. I mean, you know, if, if you give a baby antibiotics in the first three years of their life, they're eight times more likely to have an allergy or asthma by the time they're eight. That says it all because the gut microbiome is totally linked to the lung microbiome. And so anything that happens bad in the, in the gut microbiome happens in the lung microbiome. That's how you get asthma. So bottom line, definitely the health of mum and even their stress and their emotions can affect baby in the early years of its life. Okay, good start is so important, isn't it? Um, Celia Whiting, or Cecilia Whiting, sorry, asked one that uh, a bit, could be a little bit controversial. A question for the show is, how do people on low FOD MAC diets due to fructose malabsorption improve their microbiome when some of the good gut foods cause an adverse reaction by feeding their bad bacteria population? Right, well, the first quest question is why have you got a um a, a bad bacteria population i mean i am going to be controversial i hate things that are constructive you yeah. know i agree totally with what thomas lodi said it's all about nature this you know you should be as natural as you possibly can be and when someone does a fodmap diet goodness me what is that all about use a mediterranean diet you know sardinia more 80 90 and 100 year olds than anywhere else in the world they don't do so badly, do they? So you're basically saying, if I'm on a FODMAP diet, I actually, all my bad bacteria don't like it. Well, get rid of your bad bacteria, kill them all off the way I showed you, I told you, and start putting good bacteria in there. And most importantly, and this, this, this really is the thing, you can't just stop at 0.5 when I, I said, you know, there's five ways to build you. You've got to eat, you've got to eat. So we know that oily fish, fish oils, extra virgin olive oil, um, avocados, all put your gut bacteria up. We know that berries and walnuts contain elagitanins, which are one of the best things for putting your gut bacteria up. Then there's pectins, then there's inulins, even a little bit of brown chocolate and even a glass of red wine. You know, you've got to, you've got to eat food. You're not feeding yourself only, you're feeding your 90 trillion gut bacteria. So I, I mean, I don't pretend to even understand the FODMAP. Uh, diet or even why it exists. If I was a little bit serious, by the way, would I be better off with two glasses of red wine? Um, you can have two glasses a week. Merlot, old chap, Merlot. Right. Okay. <laughs> Trish in Sussex. My father died at 64, having contracted Alzheimer's disease in his mid 50s. I have the physique and characteristics of my father, and at 62 years old myself, I'm worried I might inherit, despite my doing the best to eat healthy and walk daily. I'm prescribed two milligrams of candostatin daily, 20 milligrams of omeprazole, which I take on occasion. I also have a high dose of vitamin C, D3 and zinc daily. My father was a chef when many pots were made from aluminium. Could his disease be environmental rather than of hereditary kind? Oh, I'm gonna give you another answer, one word answer, neither, or perhaps both. Um... My dad, as you know, my dad died of Alzheimer's. Um, my dad basically became bed bound at 64 and I'm seven years past that. 
So I refuse to accept there's any hereditary factor in it at all. Now, I know, as we said earlier on, they're playing games up here all the time, drugs companies, and also we fall into the trap in the natural health industry and we've said that resveratrol, high dose resveratrol can help enormously uh, in reverse the early stages of Alzheimer's and things like this. But what do we know about Alzheimer's and dementia? We know that sugar is the ultimate poison. We know that a number of bugs get together, E. coli and other things, and they form little handkerchiefs in the gut. And the immune system knows these handkerchiefs, you know, on the lining, the immune system knows these handkerchiefs shouldn't be there. So the immune system comes out to attack. Unfortunately, the, the immune system is not localized. So the immune system attacks anything that looks like a handkerchief all around the body, okay, these tiny handkerchiefs. And what looks like a handkerchief? Amyloid plaque in the brain. And so we know that the amyloid plaque gets attacked and the immune system damages the cells around the outside. I'm giving you the short version. So that's what's happening again. This is the problem, then it goes up there. And um, what I would say is it's not sort of Alzheimer's that runs in family or aluminium pots. It's a, you know, something going wrong with the, with the gut microbiome. That's really what's doing it. And um, you may have the same traits as your dad, but I, I mean, ask yourself why you're on the Emeprazole, ask yourself why you have to take a Candida pill, go rebuild yourself properly. Yeah, it's going to use a sticky blaster. Yeah, um, I think something. It's not directly connected, but I believe it is connected. So Marie Papillon in Canada says, I'm 72 and I'm on blood thinners. I've had two pulmonary embolisms, one thrombophobitis in the left leg and the same in my right arm. Should I have the COVID vaccination or not? This question is torturing me. I, as you know, am very worried about the COVID vaccine. And we are now getting word that COVID itself, uh, if you've caught it, you make antibodies and the antibodies may be promoting blood clots. That's COVID itself. And we've got these, these um, stories about how the AstraZeneca Oxford one is creating antibodies that are causing blood clots. So straight away you see, well, is it, is it actually the vaccine or is it actually happening naturally? We know that some people who had COVID also have damaged their immune system appearing about six or nine months later, not the, vac not the vaccine doing it. But <laughs> I mean, I can't answer this one because I thought that Moderna and Pfizer vaccines were a joke. And the chief exec coming out recently and saying that um, we were gonna have to be prepared to have Pfizer every year. And then I did a blog, you know, does this vaccine prevent you catching it? No. Does this vaccine prevent you going to hospital? No. Does this vaccine prevent you dying? No. And does it prevent you, you giving it to the person sitting next to you on the airplane? No. So why am I going to have to have a vaccine to go on an airplane? It doesn't make sense. But then I was going to go with the Oxford one. And I, I just, I don't know about everybody else. I kind of need this all to clear, to clear up. And I need some politicians to stop lying to me and to actually make some sensible, serious science decisions. And I, I don't know whether I told you this, but we asked a guy in the government in Thailand, why do you think you've got no COVID out here? And he said, because we're all sort of army government people. We don't know the first thing about science. So we leave it to the doctors. What a great answer. We leave it to the doctors. And you know, and I know, doctors have been finding ways of beating this in America and in Britain. Leave it to the doctors. Let's get a panel of doctors to tell us what to do. Because this is getting to be a joke. So I'm really sorry, I don't know the answer. You've got DVTs and things like this. It sounds to me that you get, you're caught between a rock and a hard place. If you catch it, you might get more blood clots. If you have a jab, you might get more blood clots. Can't help. Yeah. Carl Stacey says, we're down to the last couple of questions on time, really. Uh, we have so many questions come in. Carl Stacey asks, I'm due to start chemotherapy for metastatic prostate cancer. 
which I'm not thrilled about. How can I keep on a healthy gut and immune system during this? Really hard, Carl, really hard. Um, I think you're far better off going on our website and looking at our little um, article on 10 ways to improve your chemo and reduce the side effects. Things like melatonin, Hinocchio, uh, turmeric, berberine, um, take oregano oil throughout so you don't get a bad problem. Um, have some hyperbaric oxygen or do exercise, whatever. I think you're far better off looking at that. I would say again, as I've given the answer a couple of times now, you're in trouble keeping the good guys up. So just make sure you have no bad guys. Prostate cancer, I worked on with a professor in Australia and gave him my theory and he went away and checked it and agreed. There is almost certainly a high level of yeast wrapped around the prostate. And as I said earlier on, you can get yeast in your cranium. They re when they wrap themselves around an organ or whatever, they reduce the oxygen because they're anaerobes and that makes the cancer thinks it's Christmas. So use oregano oil, you know, go on to it, you know, almost permanently. And secondly, we know that herpes is a big player. I've told you about that. We know that um, bad bacteria are big players. So you, I've given you the program. I think you've just got to make the best of a bad job, 10 ways to improve your chemo. That's what you need to read. And secondly, kill your bad guys while you're having all this. And then the second it's over, throw the good guys down your throat. Okay, Mandy Brown asks, um, how do you cure SIBO, which of course is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Um, if your ileocecal valve is not working properly, I think mine was damaged uh, and had adhesions when my appendix was taken out age 10. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, Okay, how do you cure SIBO? Answer is, I don't know. In fact, we don't know. The, the, the fraternity don't know. And the reason is, is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So you shouldn't have all these bacteria in there. And SIBO is linked to, you know, Hashimoto's and things like that. And so you shouldn't have them in there. And yet, you'll go onto American sites and they'll say, take a probiotic. I say, Stand up, take a probiotic. I never overclaim a probiotic, as you know. You know, probiotics do, a, you, you, probiotics are holding things while you do clever stuff. That's what probiotics are for. And um, taking a probiotic is not gonna do any bloody good because you're actually, you've got these bugs in the wrong place. So having more bugs, is, they're still gonna be in the wrong place. Again, I think I would just, at level one, make sure I didn't have any bad guys. That would be my first port of call. Make sure I don't have any bad things in there. Kill off the bad things. And I think with your valve problem, you're always gonna have a leak. But the other thing I discovered when I looked at SIBO, and I can't say this is meant to be a cure. This is just me doing some research. As you may or may not know, your whole gut moves. You get a kind of electrical impulse about every hour and a half. And that moves the food down. It also moves the bugs down. So make sure you're allowing yourself at least a couple of hours between meals if you've got SIBO, because that does seem to help. Now, again, I didn't find that in connection with SIBO. I found that in connection with something else, but it does seem to help. And actually by having this gap, then you have the electrical impulse. You do move bugs down and on. So as much as I know. Well, last question from Jane Thomas. Should we purchase lab tests to understand what exactly is happening in our gut? And if so, are there particular ones in the UK which you would recommend? <sighs> very, very difficult. First of all, a lot of these test companies come and go. Um, secondly, when the tests come back, I don't know where you get the bugs from. A lot of people don't know where you get the bugs from. I mean, Acomancia, when I saw it in short supply in one lady, I went off and looked at what fed it, what fed its, its little friends. <clears throat> and it was pomegranate, um, green tea, and... Um, Cranberries, that's a bit of a limited list really, isn't it? Um, to get it up from 0.2% to 
What I would say about it is, I mean, yes, lately I've had a couple of documents from Atlas come across my desk, Atlas. Um, I didn't think they were very good because the conclusions tended to be a mass market. You know, they, they printed some of the conclusions out for everybody. Um, sorry to knock Atlas. Um, you know, it's the only one I've seen lately. Um, Julian Kenyon thought the only way to do it properly was to have an MRA and A test, but I think that would be expensive and so on. So I think, I, I don't know how useful they are. I, I just think that the sort of basic gut rebuild I've got on, if you do it properly, it works. I mean, I've give, I have to say, I've given up doing gut rebuilds, A, because I don't have time, and B, because I kept getting a lot of ladies from the West Coast of America who, when I said, you know, I think you need to go on oregano or oregano oil out there, they would say, I've done that. You said, what, for 12 weeks? Oh, no, for three. <laughs> and then you say, you'd say, I want you to give up sugar and high fructose so syrup and alcohol. What do you mean I can't have my white wine? No. <laughs> and it was like, I don't think you're being serious. Whereas when people have got cancer, they're serious. They know that they need to fix it and they will go and fix it. And that's what I like about helping people with cancer. We fix people. And, you know, you, I'm in the middle of making, what is it, eight, eight videos now of people I've helped to beat cancer. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's enjoyable to do that with, for people. Uh, but people with cancer want to be fixed. It's a big difference. So I think, you know, overall, out of all this, I would say, you know, a lot of people have had gut problems that have been around for years. So number one, don't think you can fix it in three weeks with a glass of white wine. Number two, you're going to take a long time to fix it. But you need to understand this is not about taking a probiotic. That, that can hold things while you're doing clever stuff. But it's about making sure that wall has no holes. It's about building a lining that goes alongside it. It's about putting mucous membrane on the outside. And it's about killing the bad guys and giving yourself loads of good guys back. I mean, we move towards a pH of seven when we're about 50. And beyond 50, we are trying to keep ourselves acid. And that's, of course, when we get cancers more after the age of 50, because we do daft things like walk into hospitals, which are full of bad guys. And so we pick them up more easily. You know, the, the, the irony is, you know, babies can't pick them up. Yeah, I remember once with my three or four year old taking him to see my aunt in hospital and the nurse telling me to get rid of my three or four year old. Yet they had, they had the gut bacteria to stop them get, picking something up. And um, I just think to answer, and it was a question earlier on, the biggest issue here and I said it to my patient last night, who's got a wife with a brain tumor and he's been looking in America and everything else. America's pulling away from us. It's frightening. They know all this stuff. My, my lady in, in Chicago, she, I've got a famous lady in Chicago hospital. And or she was in the Chicago hospital. And her oncologist had five guys down the corridor doing the human microbiome project. He knows all about it. You know, and, and in Britain, no one knows about it. In Britain, I've got people on two drugs and then they're given the immunotherapy immediately with it. Immunotherapy drugs don't work properly unless you've built your microbiome, unless, you know, you eat lots of soluble fiber. We've got loads of research on this. Why on earth in Britain would we give someone immunotherapy at the same time as two chemos? They wouldn't do it in America. So it's, this is the biggest problem I think we've got in Britain. Nobody in any sense of power in our hospitals seems to know the first thing about the gut microbiome. So, so Chris, was that what you great, wanted? great show. <laughs> Your knowledge never ceases to astound me. Your research is unbelievable. Um, can I ask, what's the next show, Chris? Um, I've got Sophie True coming on in about second week in April, whatever the Sunday is. Um, third week in April, third Sunday in April, Sophie True. And she got a rare form of lymphoma. She's a young lady. She's about 26, 27 now. And she's beaten it so far. And she's going to come on and tell me exactly how she beat her rare cancer. And she's done loads of things, not just practical. She's done lots of emotional things too. Lovely, lovely lady. 
she set up True Fields, which is like Woodstock for cancer people in Sussex every year. Of course, COVID's put pay to that, but you know, she's really giving something back to the community. So I'm really be, I'm going to be pleased to interview her. Good. Okay. And of course, people can actually sign up for five pounds to watch it. That's it's 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 a, it's a ten pound show. It's it's not free. It's a ten pound show because we need to raise money. You keep telling me for Cancer Active, but the simplest thing to do is just to join Cancer Active community because you just make your donation of five quid a month and you get you get you know cheap cheaper cheaper um, supplements and you get all the past magazines and you get all the shows to watch whenever you want. You don't have to watch them on Sunday. Even the past shows, that's right. We do get people saying, oh, I can't watch on Sunday. The answer is join the community. Yeah, it's as simple as that. So the next show is actually going to go out on the Sunday and the Monday. Sorry, this show is going to go out on the Sunday and the Monday because it's Easter weekend. Yep. So they do get an extra day on this one to watch it. Yep. Chris, it's been fantastic. I've enjoyed being with you this morning. Um, all I can say is enjoy that terrible weather you're going out there and, you know, <laughs> stuck with. <laughs> I'm back playing golf now. I'm back playing Good golf. Way. I wish I was. Cheers <laughs> now. Take well, care. Okay, Bye. Take care. Thanks. Bye.